Hey everybody, my name is Andrew. And I'm Suzanne. And you're listening to Culips. Hey everyone, welcome back to another edition of the Culips English podcast. Today we have a chatterbox episode for you. And if you're not familiar with our chatterbox series, it's where we let you listen in on completely natural, unscripted English conversations. And today I am joined by my trusty co host, Suzanne. Hello, Suzanne. How are you? Hi, Andrew. Hi, guys. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm getting a little bit hungry, to be honest with you. I'm feeling a little rumble in my stomach. It's approaching lunchtime here where I am. Yeah. So, so I'm getting hungry, but I'm okay, Suzanne. I'm okay. And I'm excited to talk about the topic at hand here today because yeah. it's, it's my favorite type of, of topic. It's a suggestion that was sent to us by a listener. I'm going to read the email that we received here. It was from a listener whose name is Steffi. I think that's maybe her English nickname and her Chinese name. She's from China. I'm going to butcher the pronunciation. I'm sorry. It's Hui Ching. Hui Ching. Okay. So Steffi will use that nickname easier for me. Said, <laughs> uh, Dear Culips, I have been listening to your podcast for a few months. I really enjoy listening to your episodes. Recently, you were talking about high school in Canada. Could you also record an episode and talk about university in Canada? I'm a Chinese student, but I live in Germany. For example, in Germany, we have to collect 180 credits to get a bachelor degree. Some courses offer five credits and the other 10 credits. The tuition is around 300 euro for one semester and inclusive of the transportation ticket. We can use it to take the bus or subway all day in the whole semester. So I would like to know how many credits do you need to graduate with a bachelor's degree? Do you have to pay for every course you need to take? Do you have two or four semesters in a year? How many people will be in a course? Do you have to write a final exam or presentation for credits? And what about transportation for students? The final question is, do students live at home or share an apartment? These questions are very interesting for me because university life in every country is different. Thanks very much. Okay. Wow. That's a lot of questions. Yeah. Lots of questions. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get right to it. Before we do, though, I want to remind all of our listeners here about the study guide for this episode, which is available for download on our website. And it's filled with lots of good things like the transcript, some detailed vocabulary explanations and examples of all the key words from this episode. And, and there's other good things in there too. The best way to really to experience it is just to give it a download and check it out. So culips.com, visit the website and you can do that. Yeah. So let's uh, let's take a stab at some of these questions here. Let's see. How about we start with the transportation aspect? Yeah, that's great. When I was a student in Canada, my university offered a U pass. It was called a U pass. And in Victoria, I went to the University of Victoria for my undergrad. We don't have a subway. There's no subway system in Victoria, so. It, we didn't get to ride that, but we could ride the bus unlimited for free. Nice. I guess actually it wasn't free. It was included in our tuition fee. I think there was maybe 50 or $75 of our tuition fee was earmarked for the U-Pass. Okay. But if you considered the U-Pass price compared to a regular year-long transportation pass price, it was a considerable discount that students got. That's really great. 
this is for buses. There's no, this is not for a metro, like any train. You said there's no train. Yeah, there, there was no train. It was only for the bus, but that was the only system. I'm sure if the city had a subway, we would have been able to ride the subway too, <laughs> but yeah. it didn't exist there. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't think there was a subway where I went to university for my undergrad either. I went to school at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. um, and I believe mm -hmm. it was just buses as well. I want to say, though, everything was really close in walking distance unless you wanted to go really far, like, you know, into the countryside. Then you would take a bus or maybe rent a car with a bunch of friends. But for the most part, everything was in walking distance. I actually walked everywhere or rode a bike. So that was my transportation once I was in, you know, once I was at university. My family lived far away, so I would fly home for breaks or drive. Sometimes we, I would hitch a ride with a friend and we would drive across country. It was pretty fun. Nice. Yeah, that was a cool way to see the, the country. But yeah, I would say on foot and on bikes. And there's a lot of bike racks and things, so it was very conducive to riding bikes. I also rode my bike almost every day as an undergrad. Although we got the U pass, we had the transportation pass. Yeah. There was no option. You couldn't opt out of this pass. You had to huh. accept it as part of your tuition fees. But yeah, even though I had that pass, I would still ride my bike to school every day just because I love riding bikes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really got into it in, in university. The next thing that I want to mention here is something that really shocked me. Okay. Steffi said in her message that tuition was about 300 euros per semester in Germany. That's cheap. That's so cheap. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I wish we had that in Canada. And I think it's even more extreme in the States. Oh, yeah. What was your tuition like at, at Carnegie Mellon? You guys are going to die. You guys are going to be like, <laughs> <"Abba."> um, <laughs> so you guys have to remember that I'm older than Andrew and older than most of you listeners maybe in university now. So I was in my undergrad program between 1995 and 1999. So I was, it was okay. the 90s. Um, Back in the 90s. Yeah. And then my tuition, so this is a long time ago. So this was like over 20 years ago. No, I guess this year is 20 years. I graduated 20 years ago. Wow, that's crazy. It was $27,000 a year in 1995, okay? Whoa, whoa. That. So this is for a year for two semesters. Two semesters only. Wow. And that did okay. not include my housing and my food. Right. Did not include. And your books. Right. Did not include. Right. It was just, just tuition. Just tuition. The first year I stayed on campus and then the second year I was like, it's actually cheaper for me to live off campus than pay the additional money that it costs to live on campus. So I wound up, this is kind of another question of hers, but I wound up moving off campus, which was so much fun and living with another friend, like a friend in my program. Okay. So I just want you to kind of have a vision of what it was like. I went to a conservatory of acting. And so it's really hard to get in. And there were only 15 of us that were accepted. In the program? That year? Yes, in my program. Yeah. And it's a private school. Carnegie Mellon is a private school. So that's why I think the, I Googled it about five years ago, and it was $62,000 a year. So I want to say US. So I want to say it's probably even gone up. And so it, it might be about sixty five at least $1,000 a year. And you're going for four years. Um. It's wow. expensive. It's really expensive. It's really expensive. 
Yeah. I know. I had student loan debt until the age of 39 years old. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you how you financed that because uh, you have to be quite well off to be able to afford that. And I had scholarships too (laughs) as well. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So the situation in Canada is a little bit better than the States. It's not as expensive. Um, Probably the total cost of my four-year degree was around maybe about the same price as you paid for one year. (laughs) So it's probably around $25,000 for a four-year degree. Yeah, but that's a lot more than 300 euros. (laughs) It's still a lot more than 300 euros, yeah. Man, I wish I could have paid that. (laughs) I should have went to university in Germany. (laughs) This is the take home here. Um, Or France, it's free. And France, it's free. Yeah. But but like you mentioned, Suzanne, when you attend a university that's not near your home, you have to pay for accommodation. You have to pay for food. You have to pay for books and all of these extra things. So yeah, although my tuition fee, total tuition fee was maybe around $25,000 Canadian, the cost is considerably more because I did have some part-time jobs here and there while I was a student, but nothing that really covered the total uh, expenses that I had to pay. So yeah, me as well, I had to take out some student loans to be able to finance my university education. Suzanne, you mentioned that there were 15 people in your cohort. Steffi asked about class size. So maybe there were only 15 people in your program, but let's say you were taking just an elective class, a general class. How many students would be in the classroom usually? So we did actually take some elective classes and uh, like some history courses. I also took an art history class and a language too. And in those larger classes, the lecture classes would hold probably about 100, 150 students. And then we had breakout sessions where we had a TA and those would be maybe like 20 or 25 students Mm, in those classrooms. Yeah. Um, I took a poetry class and it was probably about 30, 35 students as well because it was a very popular class. Okay. Yeah, but for the most part, the class sizes were pretty small. Otherwise, like aside from the lecture classes at CMU, my class sizes were really small, which is one of the reasons why the tuition, I think, is so expensive. (laughs) Yeah, probably that explains it. Yeah. And you, what about your class size? Yeah, so I have a similar experience to you. I think the first year classes that all students are required to take or that are really popular with many, many different types of majors, like for example, Psych 101 or Astronomy 101 or Sociology 101, these kind of introductory survey classes to some of the popular subjects at university. They are huge, right? They'll be held in a lecture hall and there'll be you know, over 150 to maybe even 300 students in one class. Wow, yeah. And they're, they're just massive. And yeah, obviously the professor can't handle marking all of those papers and grading all of those tests uh, on his own or on her own. So there are TAs, teaching assistants that help the professor And yeah, I think for some of these classes, there is a lab component as well. So you go to the lecture in the lecture hall, maybe once or twice a week. And then you also go to a lab that's much smaller with the TA, maybe 10 or 15 students, more like a seminar. And and you would do this once a week as well. So there's these massive lectures. But the deeper you get into your university career, I feel like the more specialized the classes become, the more niche and the fewer students there are. So by the time you're a fourth year student, maybe you are taking uh, a seminar on 
some very niche aspect of history, there'll be like 10 students in the seminar together. Uh, so it really okay. gets more focused. You get more individual attention from the professor the deeper you go into your studies. Yeah, that's I think the same with the conservatory training. It's a very specific kind of university when you are at a, a university with a with a conservatory because you audition to get in. It's not it's your grades, but it's more about your performance and then you're with the same people for four years and you really grow up together. Like they become your family. It's very similar to becoming like a, a, a an artistic family. Mm-hmm. And we also get to know the, the, you know, the few designers and the few directors and the uh, majors and the writers, mm. the playwrights, the musical theater group. It's not just 15 people, but you're in your classes, you're with the same people all the time. Mm. And you really see each other grow and you learn from that by watching someone go from 18 year old freshman year to like, you know, 21 and they're really they've learned a lot more and they're performing really well and it's quite impressive to watch. There's a lot of pressure when you have a smaller class like that and you're really under the microscope. Mm. So people are really looking at you because you don't just blend into the crowd and you're on the hot seat a lot in your classes. Mm. There's a lot of opportunity to fail Mm. (laughs) as well. (laughs) And because of that, they actually do what's called a sophomore cut. So actually at at sophomore year, every semester we would have our juries. So we would go and sit in our conference with all of our teachers by ourselves. It was us at the table and all of our teachers and the teachers would give us oral. A lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they do that anymore, but they did during my year and I mean, you would be friends with these people for two years and then you work very closely with them. Mm -hmm. They become your family and then they're asked to leave at sophomore year sometimes. And it's so sad and it's just shocking and it was tough. So you actually end up sometimes with less people than you started with. Wow. That is so different from my university experience because- You know, I have a degree, I have a double major degree in history and English literature, and I felt that there was no cohesion between students in the classes. Like, I wasn't really too friendly with students in my class. There was not a big effort by the university to try and make students of the same major mesh and get along with each other. I'm sure there was, there was a history club that I was kind of affiliated with, but I didn't really go to any of their meetings or anything. Maybe if I had been more proactive and and got involved in the history community or the literature community, we would have had some cohesion with other students. But for the most part, I think students were kind of strangers with each other. A lot of students would just come to lecture, take their notes and then leave. You know, wasn't a lot of kinship there. Yeah, that's really different. We spent like Breakfast, lunch, dinner. Wow. I mean, we were together from like 8, 20 in the morning till sometimes 1130 at night wow. every day because we were in crew. So we'd have to like go and paint sets and things, make costumes. I also, I lived off campus, right? So there were students that lived on campus in the dorms and those students were super tight because they're spending you know, almost 24 seven with each other in class. And yes. they go back home in the dining hall. You can tell the students that are in the dormitory because they're always together and they're, they're super tight with each other. But since I lived off campus, I was kind of removed from that campus community. And to be honest, that was totally fine with me. I had my friends outside of university. So I just kind of went to school, did my thing. Yeah. And rolled home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's really different. That's cool. I think, yeah, we also like, I mean, you had what I think is closer to a, a, a real university experience. Not that mine wasn't real, but it, it was a very specific, I mean, not everyone goes to a conservatory of music or acting or something like that. So it was definitely a specific 
type. And even at Carnegie Mellon, just the acting program, and I think maybe the opera singing program was conservatory. The rest was liberal. I mean, it was, you know, there were engineering engineering students and there were um, English students and there's a really amazing architecture school so as well there. So it's that they had a regular <laughs> college experience, just expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So we both had very different experiences at university, but I think this is actually great because it gives our listeners an opportunity to learn about the different types of university experiences that we can have in North America. Yeah. Yeah. So, Steffi, thank you for your question. I'm sorry we didn't have time to cover all of those questions that you asked, but I hope that we at least answered some of your questions. And Sue, I think we should leave it here for today. I've noticed that yeah. across the street from me, some construction guys have started sawing oh. <laughs> and they're making a lot of noise. I don't want to annoy our listeners with some background noise here. So we should maybe wrap it up. All right. Thank you everyone for listening. Don't forget that the study guide for this episode's on our website. And also we're all over the place on social media, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I think that's all of them, right, Sue? That's good. Yeah, yeah. We've got it all covered. We've got it all covered. Just search for the Culips English Podcast and you can find us there. And finally, our email address very important. Our email address is yes. contact at qlips.com. So if you have a question for us or a suggestion for a future episode topic, then just drop us a line. Let us know. We love to hear from you. We really do. All right, guys. Well, we'll be back soon with another brand new episode and we'll catch you then. Talk to you later. Yeah. Bye. Bye.